Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. Jack fell down and broke his crown. And Jill came tumbling after. If you haven't seen the movie, you'll think I'm absolutely insane. If you've seen the movie, you'll know what the hell I'm doing. Hello, huge movie fanatic. Nay, stop and gone by. Coming at you once again for one of my famed movie slash Blu-ray reviews. Today I'm going to be reviewing the movie and Blu-ray of... Blood Harvest, the Bill Rebane movie from 1986. And then I'll be reviewing the Vinegar Syndrome Blu-ray slash DVD combo release that came out in... 2018, last year. So I first saw this movie, I think in 2010, <clears throat> um, being a, you know, more or less a kind of a fan of Bill Rabane's work. I mean, I grew up with Rana. Rana, The Legend of Shadow Lake was the very first Bill Rabane movie I ever saw at the age of 14. Later on, many, 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 many years later, I'd end up seeing the Alpha Incident, and in the credits I was like, Bill Rabane, oh my god, he did Rana. I mean, I kind of just, I don't know, at the time, you know, ever, ever since I saw Rana up until I saw Alpha Incident, I kind of just figured Rana was just a, a one, one-off kind of movie that someone did, and I don't know, I mean, Rana was, anyway, so then I, you know, I saw Alpha Incident, and then I saw some other stuff, Capture a Bigfoot, and Invasion from Inner Earth, and other kinds of stuff. This particular movie is pretty much... It's kind of sad because it's kind of, if, if it's not like the last, you know, real movie he did, it's one of the last. It's kind of when his shooting ranch studios up in Gleason, Wisconsin, or wherever the hell this stuff was made, was kind of, this might have been one of the last, if not the last, shooting ranch um, production. So, I mean, it's kind of a sad, it's like an end of an era, you know, like that spanned who knows how long, 10, 15 years or something like that, or more or whatever, but... Um, you know, one thing that is diff extremely different this movie, before I start the review, than the other Bill Rebane movies that I saw is, you know, at the time, in the mid-80s, obviously, with Friday the 13th and Nightmare on Elm Street, and, you know, Chainsaw movies, well, of course, you know, Texas Chainsaw would only have two movies around this time, but, uh, you know, the, 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 the envelope was continually being pushed and pushed and pushed for gore. So one thing that's different about this movie than, say, Rana or Alpha Incident or other kind of Bill Rebane movies that from the 70s and stuff is that this is, it really pushes the, you know, the gore. I mean, there's not a whole hell of a lot of gore, but the gore that's there is relatively good and kind of graphic, and it also is kind of just shows uh, blatant, what's that called? Just, you know, this female nudity, just, uh, you know, ex exploitative, in an exploitative fashion, more or less. Basically, the premise of this movie is it's, uh, takes place in, you know, just this rural town in Wisconsin or whatever, this relatively attractive chick. Oh gosh, you know what, before I even start the review, I should also mention that this is the first and I think last movie that this guy, I guess he was some kind of musician by the name of Tiny Tim, it was kind of his first billing in this movie, and this was kind of a big deal for him. I think he thought it was going to be, you know, a beginning of a movie career or something. I, from what I know, as I said, I think it's the first and last movie he would appear in. Um, I don't know how much longer after this he died or whatever, but that's that's one thing. You know, I, I know nothing about this guy. Like I said, apparently he was a musician, something like that. I mean, you know, who, I, I don't remember, I mean, I don't know if his shtick was to dress up like a clown or whatever. I'm, you know, I'm not a, I, I don't know anything about Tiny Tim, but I should say that, you know, this is a big deal for like, oh, Tiny Tim starring in, and it's just like, okay, who's Tiny Tim? But, uh, you know, it, it's it's a rather kind of, you know, I don't know, it's, it's a movie that's supposed to be all Tiny Tim, and it's just like, oh my god, the role he plays, as we'll come to find out, is just, oh my gosh, it's just nothing, basically. So this movie starts with this, you know, the, the second billing in this movie is this really, really you know, hot chick uh, who's coming home from college, back home to the farm, and, uh, you know, while she was away, all kinds of stuff happened, like all kinds of farmers, you know, losing uh, losing their farms due to foreclosure and all this and that, and her parents work at the bank. I don't know if they're higher-ups at the bank or whatever. She comes home to her farmhouse, her parents' house, being, you know, kind of, you know, there's like words, you know, painted on, on the outside of it, like get out or bitch or pig or assholes, whatever the hell words are painted on the outside of the house. And, you know, there's no one, you know, parents are nowhere to be found inside the house. And 
there's this scary dummy thing hanging from the ceiling when she and them right in the entryway when she walks in. So basically she comes home from college to this really, you know, precarious situation which we can only assume wasn't this way when she left for college or whatever. And uh, she comes home to this empty farmhouse wondering where mom and dad is and she encounters this, uh, throughout the movie, this, you know, Tiny Tim character of, uh, what the hell's his name? Marvelous Mervo, just this really, really eccentric, goofy-ass character who's like, I think spends the majority of this movie like wearing clown makeup and just dressed in the stupid clown stuff and is always just singing these stupid songs and stuff. You know, his big, huge, you know, first billing role, Tiny Tim's in this movie, is just this character, this eccentric character who just pops in and out and just does random nothing in this stuff. He'll just be like, sing a few lines of something and just exit the frame as if he's some kind of you know, long time star that we all know and love. You know, his, you know, screen time and the portrayal of, you know, or the the business that Tiny Tim is given to do in this movie, I think is is absolutely ridiculous. And, you know, I just, it's, it's just kind of sad what his first and only movie, you know, really turned out to be or whatever. It's just, I don't know, I, I just don't understand how, like, as a guy himself or as a musician or performer, how he could think that what he was doing while they were filming this movie was in any way any kind of creative expression in any kind of confident sense whatsoever. It's just really weird. So as I said, hot ass uh, Jill comes home from college to an empty farmhouse and you know people are throwing bricks to the window, leaving scary dummies hanging in from the ceiling inside of the house and painting you know explanatives on the outside of the house and uh, Marvelous Mervo's got this brother, I think this younger brother named Gary, who, you know, as we come to learn throughout the course of this movie, uh, Jill and Gary were kind of childhood, you know, friends slash sweethearts. I mean, like, you know, Gary obviously had a thing for Jill. I don't really know if necessarily Jill had a thing for Gary. There's this bit in the, where they go up in a treehouse and they kind of reminisce and talk about, you know, their her dad walking in, you know, coming to the treehouse and walking in there, you know, surprising them and you know, his dad be or her dad being really mad about you know finding them together. So maybe they were in the in the in the process of foreplay or whatever, or, or you know maybe five play. Who knows how far along they were? I can one can only assume they were engaging in you know sexual activities or whatever. So um, that's the premise of this movie. It's it's basically just. Um, you know, it's, it's very similar. I reviewed a couple of years ago, I think, at this point, or maybe last year, I don't remember when I reviewed it, but this movie, Luther the Geek, that came out like in 1989 or 1990, that was also distributed on Blu-ray by uh, Vinegar Syndrome as well, and I own it and re have reviewed that as well. And, the, you know, these movies were made really around the same kind of time, within two or three years of each other, and they're very, 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 very similar, where the whole, you know, basically the whole movie takes place at this farmhouse with the... Um, I don't remember if Luther, yeah, Luther the Geek has a barn as well. So these movies are very, very, very similar. And then you've got kind of a main character who's like, although I think Beth in that movie ends up dying or something like that. But then you've got a, you know, relatively hot female character with some, you know, just kind of gratuitous, just nude scenes for nude scenes sake. And, you know, being a heterosexual male, I've got no problem with that at all. But it is interesting how similar, you know, Luther the Geek and Blood Harvest are. So Jill just spends, I don't know, the first 15 or 20 minutes, well, basically the whole movie, she's kind of wondering where the hell her parents are. And, you know, anytime she talks with Merville's younger brother, Gary, he just reassures her, oh, they're probably just out, you know, on a vacation or out doing this or that or, you know, living it up or doing something and just kind of poo-poos her or whatever and what's so funny about this movie and this this main character of Jill is you know and I once again being a heterosexual male I've got no problem with this but you know once I don't know she 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 spends like the majority of like the middle part of this movie just like in like, like with no pants on and just like just some kind of a top on whether it's her boyfriend's button up or you know just this kind of short robe thing from taking after taking a shower it's, it's so fun how she spends the, the better part of the, the you know the 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 middle part of this movie just basically with no bottoms on and just kind of showing off her smooth uh you know silk silky legs <laughs> So another thing that we learned through dialogue is that at, at one point, I don't know if it was, you know, recently, within the last couple of years, you know, before this movie takes place, Gary's, 
you know, Gary's and Marvelous Morvo's parents were murdered, and it's like this unsolved, you know, unsolved case, and it's just like it kind of haunts Mervo and you know, Gary, and maybe it's a reason why. I think it's kind of hinted as a reason why, you know, Marvelous Mervo might be kind of, you know, a little goofy or nutty in this movie. Um, that's just like a little detailed backstory about the character of, of Gary. And then at some point in the movie, you know, obviously when, when you know, Gary and, and Jill are catching up and stuff like that, you know, of course Jill has to inform Gary that um, <clears throat> she's engaged with at that point you know Gary's kind of demeanor changes and very understandably so because you know it's kind of a Jill's kind of a sex pot uh, hot ass girl and you know they as you know they had childhood kind of love affair or at least one way I don't know if she you know Gary definitely had a thing for her or had slash has or whatever so when the news came about Jill, you know, having met someone in college and being now coming home engaged, I mean, obviously that kind of shatters Gary's world. So I don't know if it's like 30 or 35 minutes into the movie or somewhere around that time, uh, Jill just, the movie just kind of stops, not that it ever starts, to just basically have a really brief shower scene when midday just Jill decides to take a shower. I don't, I don't have any problem with that. We kind of see her disrobe and get into the shower, and we don't see her in the shower because it's one of those sliding, you know, sliding glass or plastic you know doors or whatever for the shower thing but when she gets in the shower we see this hand is this mysterious lurker that's you know dressed in I think we mostly see him in shadows at first this is hand and presumably in the basement that you know cranks this water lever down or and it makes it seem like it, it makes the water really hot maybe it makes it really cold I don't know it sends Jill you know dashing out of the shower um, just being like what the hell's going on so Obviously, you know, her fa her and her family aren't very popular around town lately because of what, you know, her, her parents work at this bank, which is foreclosing on all these local farms and stuff, so she kind of just, you know, assumes that the, you know, the this, this stuff that she's getting or the, you know, this, this prowler or all this crap she's getting, you know, while taking a shower or whatever and this, whatever else and stuff is because of, you know they're they're not being very popular with the with the townsfolk and stuff as a result of the foreclosures you know and then let's I think she gets out of the shower and, and gets in her robe thing or whatever and then we it's just kind of stupid how we see them like the hand <coughs> puts the the thing back like the water thing back or something like that it's really weird because then she goes into the kitchen and tries to get a glass of water and it's like the water doesn't work and she leaves it on oh no and after that then we see the hand do the water thing, it's like, tsh, and just starts again, and, you know, as far as Jill's concerned, she's living in a poltergeist house or whatever, but, you know, this movie is just like, I don't know, like, you know, it's like so many Bill Robain movies, I mean, it, it never, you kind of you spend the whole movie waiting for this movie to start, and, you know, it never really kind of does. And as I've already said, you know, Tiny Tim's miraculous, marvelous role as marvelous Murbo you know, this adult man in his frickin' mid to late 40s or whatever who's dressed in a clown suit and just clown makeup and just does this, you know, just randomly appears and sings some, you know, a couple bars of some song and just like, doo -doo -doo -doo, not that he says that or whatever, but then makes this kind of dumb exit or whatever. I mean, that's the extent of what Tiny Tim does in this movie. And like I say, when they were filming it, unless he was constantly, maybe he was an alcoholic and constantly drunk or whatever, but I don't understand you know, how he could not be concerned of like, oh my gosh, you know, <clears throat> that, you know, that what they were doing, or particularly with his role, was in any way anything of any kind of confidence, but whatever. You know, f strangely enough, like one of my favorite characters, or probably me, probably my favorite character in this movie is this guy who plays the sheriff that we'll see maybe two, maybe three, I think it's two times, possibly three separate times in the movie. The guy who plays him, he just does it in this kind of uh, tongue-in-cheek, just kind of easy-going way. Where the, I think the first time we're gonna, see, the first time we see the sheriff, he's all dressed to go play baseball or softball or whatever, and Jill comes to him with this concern about her missing parents and vandalized house and stuff. And it's kind of funny how he drives her back to the her you know farmhouse, and he's wearing like you know his his baseball uniform on and with the cop coat around it and the gun and like the hat on it's just kind of a cool just a little uh, character thing you know like a cool little detail to be honest that's probably one of the coolest things about this movie is the, not only that character but that little bit where he's in his baseball playing gear 
uh, you know, on duty as the sheriff, that just that look is kind of cool. You can almost see like a figure, action figure being made of this particular character. Not that he's a very important character or anything or spends very much time on screen, but that's just kind of probably one of the coolest things about the movie other than just Jill's nude scenes. So Jill spends the middle part of this movie basically just lounging around, like I said, with no bottoms and just some kind of top on or whatever. Um, at one point she's in the bed, in her bed, in her bedroom, and she's got like uh, Robin Williams posters on the wall. And one, you know, being a fan of the Arnold Schwarzenegger movie Commando, I was very thrilled to see that she's got a Commando poster on the wall and I was like, oh hell yeah, man. This is right around the time, of course, that Commando was in theaters or whatever. So uh, it's really cool to see like a Commando poster on the wall. It makes you wonder, you know, where they got it, why they decided to put that up, if Bill Ravain was a fan or, or what. But, uh, you know, she, she spends a couple, maybe two or three scenes where she's just, you know, on her bed and just, you know, painting her toenails or putting lotion on her legs. I mean, you know, you think I, you know, you think I'd like this movie more than I do for just, you know, that kind of stuff going on, but let's face it, I mean, I don't know, you gotta have, even for me, I gotta have more happening in a movie than that. Oh gosh, maybe halfway point of this movie or something like that, there's this goofy scene where this prowler is wearing jeans and this, I don't know, green army kind of jacket or whatever. At some point, I don't remember at what point we end up seeing this guy's wearing a freaking, you know, stocking on his head, kind of like uh, Boogeyman from the, that movie from the early 80s or whatever. But uh, I don't know if we see him, you know, in the stocking, stocking head thing going on in this scene. But this guy, like, she's, I always think it's so funny when, you know, there's a, there's a mysterious character who chloroforms someone while they're sleeping. Uh, it's kind of funny because, I mean, they're already asleep or whatever, but I guess their argument would be, well, you know, normally if someone's a light sleeper or whatever, you know, t being tied up and, you know, disrobed or whatever might wake them up. So while they're sleeping, we better chloroform them to make sure they don't wake up. And this guy proceeds to, after chloroforming her, open up her top and, and you know, kind of tie her legs and her feet to the bedpost or whatever, and then take some pol succession of Polaroids of her topless, you know, body just being tied up on the bed. And then later on, we'll see him like, in a clearly just one photo that's been cut into like six pieces, he's taping it onto the wall like, you know, taping these pieces, uh, these are clearly not Polaroids, it's just one picture cut up into pieces, putting them up, putting them up on a wall and just being like, eh, I don't think there's any breathing like that, but there might as well have been like, eh, eh, while he's putting these pieces up on the wall, oh my gosh. I don't know, it's probably around the halfway mark, something like that, after these photos were taken with her, you know, Jill's boyfriend who, you know, I thought you kind of, she, Jill's boyfriend calls earlier and he's like, I'm at school, so he makes it sound like he's far away, but later on he'll just show up and every now and then, I don't know, you know, every now and then the Marvelous Marvel's younger brother Gary shows up and obviously he's jealous of this guy. And, There'll be a kind of a sensuous scene where, you know, she Jill's in this robe and still not wearing any bottoms, which is fine with me, and the sensuous scene of, or quote-unquote sensuous scene where it's just like, you know, the make-out session and, you know, she, of course, once again, not that I have a problem with it, you know, it gets, becomes topless and boyfriend is kissing up on her and all this kind of stuff, so, all right. I don't know if Mar Merville appears at, you know, to uh, something disrupts their, you know, kind of lovemaking or, you know, foreplay session, and I think, uh, I don't know what, or maybe it's a prowler or something like that, something disrupts it, and she ends up, I think, taking her boyfriend's button-up shirt and putting that on, and I think the boyfriend goes out to the barn to, like, uh, oh, no, the, the boyfriend's gonna go get beer or something like that because her parents don't drink, she doesn't have beer in the house. I don't know, I, I don't know if it's some, I don't know what the hell, you know, stopped the foreplay session or whatever, but the boyfriend's gonna go to get some beer or whatever, and then when he goes out to, to the car, he sees this guy, you know, the prowler running across the field, and he chases him into the, the barn, and meanwhile, you know, Jill turns on the radio and just does this, still wearing no bottoms, and, like, the boyfriend's button up top, is and proceeds to like dance kind of ballet moves to this music on the radio and it's just like what the hell I mean it's just like there's no script and we've got some film stock and this hot chick and a barn and a you know stocking let's let's make the most of this these things we have so we see you know while Jill is doing her dancing ballet kind of dancing uh, 
you know, meanwhile, Jill's uh, boyfriend gets tied up, you know, by the feet in the barn, hoisted up like some kind of animal or whatever by this prowler who's wearing the stocking on his head. And oh my gosh, the, you know, the, ant the stakes are getting high and the ante's up or whatever. I don't know what the hell I'm saying. Another thing I want to say about this movie is in the movie Jill's got this girlfriend who works at the diner or whatever by the name of Sarah, I want to say, and gosh, the girl who plays this girl is hot too, like top heavy and like skinny as all shit, and oh my god, where are they getting these women? But th this girl, if I was making this movie, would have had a hell of a lot more screen time, screen time than she does in this movie, but she's really hot, she shows up and, uh, you know, talks to Jill and, and I think at night and then goes to leave or whatever and is chased I think by this the prowler guy and chased into the barn I think and well it's just like with the boyfriend is tied up and um, you know I think in the same scene possibly you know he's she he was, she's roped up by her ankles and then he proceeds to you know cut her pants off so she's just like in underwear and bra and stuff look you know she's relatively top heavy and it's just kind of uncomfortable to see like her hanging upside down with the bra and her tits like hanging upside down you know you know in the bra and it's just like oh man it's like we can see so much anyway why not just take the bra off but whatever it's just such a shame for to me you know when you've got these attractive hot young women and horror movies and they're just they're close to naked but they don't get naked it's just like what a it's just a shame you know just a, hu a humanity just a shame but after you know the prowler guy hoists her up and strips her down to her underwear or whatever he, I think then he just slits her throat and it's just like all the throat slitting scenes are done in you know with relatively decent uh, makeup effects but the only thing the only problem with it is it's like there's also a throat slitting right at the very beginning of the movie, kind of like that, you know, that gore at the beginning of the movie scalps right when the movie starts. You know, to be honest, you know, by the, this time of the movie, you kind of start getting sick of throat slittings because I don't know if this is the third or second one in the movie at this point, maybe the second, I don't know. But even at the second one, you're like, oh, okay, this is just a movie about hanging people up by their feet and slitting their throat. Okay, it probably happens at least three times on camera in the movie, and you're kind of like... You know, it's cool and everything, but it's, you know, at that point it gets a little kind of repetitive. You know, as I just rewatched this recently, I was just watching it going, you know, there really, really looks like a, they're trying to make Mervo look like the killer, and I really hope they're not thinking that a viewer is watching this movie thinking he could possibly be the killer because the physique, you know, you can clearly see, like, the prowler in the green army coat and the stocking on his head, the, his physique is rather slim, whereas Marvelous Mervo's physique is probably twice the weight of this, you know, the, the guy who plays the the creeper or the you know the the prowler or whatever so it's i really hope you know the filmmaker bill Rabane doesn't expect the audience to you know wonder oh my gosh you know Mer must be mervo going in and out of makeup and you know losing half his weight and putting it back on and stuff you know when he goes to kill people and then oh my gosh because you know a lot of times after something happens where someone's tied up or roped up or killed or whatever then we'll see mervo creeping around and it kind of makes you think as a viewer like i think you know, Bill Rubain's trying to, you know, say that he's a suspect, and it's just like, well, it's, this is impossible. Oh, yeah, so I think pretty much after, you know, it's very possible that Jill's girlfriend's throat slitting was the second one in the movie. Not long after that, we see Mervo creeping around, and the boyfriend's, you know, who's also hanging up upside down in the barn's throat is slit, and we kind of pan down with the camera, and we see that the blood is being collected in this, you know, this kind of... A, container thingy and we're just like, oh, that's so gross. Not long after Jill probably wakes up from some kind of nap or something, you know, probably, I think, yeah, she's still got no bottoms on and still like in her boyfriend button up, uh, you know, t-shirt or whatever and she just inexplicably for no reason kind of wakes up and goes to the fridge and opens it only to have this, this, you know, container of blood, you know, pour out as if it's attached by via rope to the door or something like that. It kind of just shoots ejects itself, this container of blood eject, ejects itself as she opens the door all, all over, you know, onto her and it kind of blood splats all over her in this kind of cool slow motion scene of then, you know, when the blood goes on the floor, she's in like, just slipping all over it in front of the fridge and it's just kind of a cool, cool little bit and it's just like, oh my god, hot chick and splattered with her boyfriend's blood and she's like half naked, it's just like, oh man, if I was a pervert I could get off on it, but I'm not a pervert so I didn't. But I did kind of enjoy it in a, just a, you know, I don't know, maybe I'll just say it was just kind of fun. But at this point, right after this happens, Gary comes in and just like, oh my gosh, 
oh my gosh, embraces her, and he's the, you know, the hero of the hour, and oh my gosh, you know, who could have done this to her, kind of a thing, and just, you know, comforting her, and it's just like, oh my gosh, this seems kind of fishy at this point. I think one of the next scenes pretty much is this scene in the in the shower slash bathtub. Um, this scene is like they're just sitting in the bathtub and, and you know, Gary's behind her. They're, she Her back is to, to him and he's, you know, they're both in their like shirts or whatever and, and clothes or whatever. And of course Jill didn't have bottoms on. But J Gary is like, while they're, they're in the tub and the shower is blasting on him, Gary's like taking off her shirt and grabbing soap and kind of rubbing it on her breasts, like, oh wow, what a nice guy, he's such a hero, like, coming to her aid in her time of need, and, you know, there to completely, you know, wash all the blood off her breasts, um, and probably, you know, wash them over again to make sure all the blood's gone, but it's just like, oh my gosh, here she's, like, traumatized, it's just kind of, actually, kind of, you almost got to give it, hand it to Bill Rebane for, I mean, that, that's one thing I do like about this movie, is it just, it goes so much more nasty in so many more arenas than anything he, anything else I've really seen him do that it's just like it kind of makes you wonder, you know, if he just felt pressure to, to go, you know, this far in this point of his career or whatever. But, you know, you, you can see, you know, that she does a pretty good job at looking distraught and disturbed by, you know, all the, you know, what just happened to her. Meanwhile, this guy is just taking her shirt off and rubbing on her tits and it's just like, it's really just kind of, oh my gosh. So after a little bit of him just uh, just rubbing on her, you know, tits with soap and just, you know, kissing on her in the bathtub or whatever, then he, I think he's seen basically, you know, carrying her naked onto the couch, puts her on the couch, and she's kind of just, you know, it looks like she's almost asleep this whole time, which would just be weird, and he just kind of covers up her naked body on the couch, and then he goes over to this spot and just kind of has this look, and he proceeds to take his clothes off, and he's basically going to you know, get on top of her and, you know, proceed to have sex with her. And for a while, for a couple of beats, she's going with it, like, calling him, you know, her boyfriend or her fiancé's name and opens up her eyes to see that it's Gary. And she's just like, oh, my gosh, get off me and all this kind of stuff. And Gary's just like, you know, she's like, I love you like a brother. And he's like, I'm sorry. And, uh... I'm not exactly sure what happens here. I think this is, you know, after that happens, and Gary might go away or something like that in shame or, you know, pretending to be shameful or whatever. And then Mervo shows up once again in one of his many amazing, fantastic, marvelous appearances. But this time, he's like, I think at this point in the movie, he's like rubbing off his clown makeup or whatever, and he's actually going to serve some actual kind of a competent purpose. He shows up to take Jill back to, I think, probably their house. I would imagine that, you know, Gary and, and Merv... Mervo live together or whatever, but, you know, at this point, Mervo explains to Jill that, in fact, her, you know, her parents weren't murdered, her parents committed suicide because, you know, their, their farm and house or whatever was going to be foreclosed on, and their, you know, livelihood and business was going to be completely destroyed, so even with two kids, who cares, you know, two children, or not children, I mean, they're full-grown men or whatever, but even with two, you know, sons or whatever, we're still just going to kill ourselves and then Gary got the brilliant idea to like string them up and hang them or whatever and make it look like it was a murder. That way it could get sympathy of the town or whatever to maybe not have the house or farm taken away from them or something like that. It's just kind of a cool twist or whatever and also to just maybe get sympathy from Jill or something like that. It's kind of a cool twist, you know, when when that's revealed, and um, so I'm actually Mervo. This is like the only time in the movie where Mervo kind of does something, except the very end, does something actually competent. So after Jill gets this information from Mervo, he's all acting. I don't know. I can't remember exactly, but he's acting weird or embracing her or something like that. I don't know. Then she grabs a gun that's just sitting there and just shoots him like right through the kind of the side of the stomach, off to the side or whatever, and he falls down. And you just kind of assume he's dead and she probably runs out. I don't know if she runs back to her place or, or whatever and oh oh okay I think I know what happened. I think basically um, while they're I think Gary appears like right when Mervo's done telling her the story or something like that and they're struggling I think and at this point I think she thinks that Mervo's the killer and that's why she shoots him and then after you know, he's shot and, you know, Mervo shot and presumed dead. I think Gary then goes into the spiel about him basically being the killer. And, you know, once this guy who played Gary this whole in this whole movie kind of turns, you know, switches roles and becomes this, you know, the, the admitted psychopathic killer or whatever, this guy who plays him 
does a really, really, really good job. And th that's one of the best things about this movie is once this guy is revealed as the killer, for the rest of the movie, he's really kind of fun and, and really does this, you know, just, you know, psychotic, you know, persona really, really well. And, you know, the, what he does with his face and stuff just to emulate the psychosis is done really well in a, in a very entertaining fashion. So at this point in the movie, wrap you know as the movie wraps up, you got to do the uh, the basically the cat and mouse thing where you know Gary's chasing Beth. I think you know not Beth. No, I'm thinking of Luther the Geek now. Bear, Gary chasing uh, Jill, probably from there his place back to uh, you know which probably isn't very far away back to Jill's place, the famous barn where everyone's hanging up. And I think she probably I would imagine he chases her into the barn and you know uh, begins to. I think, you know, where everyone's hung up there, including her, his parents, no, oh, oh, including her parents. Yeah, it's, it's revealed at the end of the movie that the mysterious, because I told you at the beginning of the review that her parents were, were missing in the whole movie, and uh, basically Gary, from what I understand, killed, killed her parents, too. I don't, I'm not exactly sure why. Oh, I think he explains this later on in this scene, you know, to, to kill her parents, so basically it was, you know, she would then go to Gary. I mean, she wanted to make, uh, or he wanted to make Jill the victim so he could be there for her and you know, get married and have a family and live happily ever after. Like, you know, that always works. Maybe I should try that. Just kidding. So, you know, there's cat and mouse uh, to the barn. There's cat and mouse in the barn where he's just, I don't know, like tries to tie her up. She escapes, you know, chase her into the silo thing with this pig hanging there, bleeding on her face. and chase her back into the main barn area where everyone's victims are hanging upside down with their throat slit, tie, gonna tie her up again, you know, gonna kill her, slit her throat because she's not going along with it, and then, you know, right at the moment he's gonna stab her or slit her throat or, or whatever, it's like, BAM, like, he gets shot, like, right here, and cut to Mervo with the rifle, yeah, he's alive, and he's doing probably his best thing he ever did in this movie at this moment where he's saving Jill's life, and uh, it's kind of a moment where even when I was rewatching it just recently, I'm like, oh wow, I keep forgetting, you know, this movie is completely forgettable, so I completely forgot about that bit. And when that happens, you're actually like, you know, you kind of just so, you get sick of Mervo characters so, so quickly that you're like, oh wow, I actually like that character at the very end of the movie for saving Jill's life or whatever. So, you know, he unties, Mervo unties her, they get out of the barn, and you know, kind of do this track over back to Gary's body on the ground, and it's like, eyes open up, and like, oh my gosh, that's the end. You know, it's like Blood blood Harvest Part 2 coming soon, or whatever, but, uh, <clears throat> yeah, so that's basically Blood Harvest. You know, as much as you think I'd, you know, kind of like this movie or whatever for being shot in Wisconsin in this rural, r rural, yes, I've got a problem with that word, rural area or whatever and farmland in summertime and stuff unfortunately the movie is just so so kind of like it's only like I don't know 87 minutes long or something like that but it, it's so it's so inexplicably slow moving and even if it's just majority of the movie is just basically panning up and down this hot chicks you know mostly nude or sometimes nude or half nude body it's still just just really, really, really a chore to get through. I'm afraid I'm only going to be able to go half of a star out of four stars for for Blood Harvest. Yes, it's it's unfortunately it's it's that bad. As much as I really want to like it, it's let's face it, it's kind of a bore. So uh, that's my review of the movie. Now on to my review of the uh, you know the the Blu-ray slash DVD combo that was put out by Vinegar Syndrome last year in 2018. As always, I'll show you the back of the box here so you can read uh, the special features. I'll read some of them. Newly scanned and restored in 4K. I mean, they, they did a 4K master of this piece of cr crud movie from its 16 millimeter original camera negative. Um, brand new commentary track with producer and co-writer. I did listen to that. I got this probably late winter, early spring. And the way the guy talks is he talks as if this is some kind of masterwork story or something like that that was just maybe not, you know, not done, you know, necessarily that competently. It's kind of funny how he thinks that his story is some kind of amazing masterpiece or whatever. Uh, every critic is going to butcher it, an archival interview with Tiny Tim on Blood Harvest. That's kind of cool, just seeing the guy in actual interviews with this guy or whatever. You can, of course, see 
Uh, well, I'll just say this one, Tiny Tim Performance and Ryan Review Footage from Niagara Falls, September 387, and of course the rest of this stuff you can read um, yourself, but um, this is a transfer that's, as it says, 4K, I mean, it kind of makes no sense to me to do a 4K transfer of something 16 millimeter, but whatever, apparently they did it. This uh, is, a, is a movie that's uh, in a 185 aspect ratio, and having just re recently rewatched it, Unlike the, the Blood Hook DVD that I just recently reviewed, this one, you know, I normally like grain, but holy Toledo, this movie might have a little too much grain for me. It's a very, very, of course, being 16 millimeter, it doesn't help. I don't know if the 4K, you know, versus the 2K of the Blood Hook transfer, I don't know if the 4K means it's going to be grainier, I don't know. For whatever reason, you know, this movie is extremely, extremely, extremely grainy and to a point where this, you know, I'm a fan of grain normally, where I, it's almost a little bit too much for me. So if you don't like grain at all, you're probably not going to be able to watch this movie at all. I mean, it's basically, you know, the probably the darker scenes that are the grainiest or whatever, but I don't know, even, no, actually, no, now that I think about it, you know, that a lot of the the brighter scenes are grainy too so this is a very one of the most kind of grainy movies or blu-rays that i've ever really seen um but you know the colors and you know the the rest of the transfer and stuff is 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 really 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 good it's just you know got a lot of grain and stuff like that so just like vinegar syndrome's release of uh, blood hook that i recently reviewed you've got uh you know basically a blu-ray slash dvd combo situation here something as i said in my review of that particular release that I'd just as soon have a DVD in addition to Blu-ray just in case you want it for you know portable DVD player purposes or if you have someone that only has a DVD player whatever I just generally like to have a DVD as well and then it also this particular release also came with this booklet which you've got uh, you know Mervo on both sides I'm not a booklet person I don't generally read this stuff but one has the option to do so if they so choose. The last page here looks to be pretty much the most interesting stuff. Photos, on-set photos. And as so often is the case with a release like this, you've got the option for this artwork that comes facing out like this, or this artwork, which I probably prefer over the close-up of the, you know, the smiling clown's face, not being a clown, you know, I don't like clowns at all. This is probably, you know, I don't know if there was ever really an official video release of this or not. I don't know exactly what, I would imagine this was maybe from some VHS cover or something like that. I'm not, a, I don't know, I'm not a big fan of this movie, so I don't know much about the history about it. But here, if you, uh, if you do this cover option, that looks like that, and, and that looks like that. So what can I say? Uh, kind of regret getting this Blu-ray <laughs> because the movie is really not that great, but whatever. I mean, you know, I'm glad to, uh, you know, it's always a good thing to support companies like Vinegar Syndrome and stuff and their efforts for doing releases like this. The more you support, you know, their releases like this, the more hopefully one would could assume, you know, they could help to, you know, help them or to make them want to do more releases of more, you know, movies that maybe you'd like to own even more than this one, which is, you don't have to, yeah, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> you know what I'm saying. Here's the killer guy in his, you know, his army jacket and his uh, boogeyman, you know, stocking thing over his head. But yeah, what can I say? Blood Harvest. It's it's not uh, by any stretch of the imagination or by any means at all not a recommended movie. I mean, if you can see it for free, I'd say go for it or whatever. If you've got a friend, you can borrow this from. I mean, you know, the one thing it does have, if you like throat slittings, if you're some psycho who likes seeing, you know, fake fake throat slittings, you might like this movie. I mean, some of the best parts of this movie, of course, are, you know, just seeing this scantily clad hot chick just, you know, getting naked on occasion and just dancing around and rubbing, you know, lotion on our legs or whatever. Anyway, thank you very much for watching this review, and as always, we'll catch you on the next one.